in order to do that, I need to tell you the story of the president and the slave. And the president in question is Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. And um, he was accused in 1802 of fathering the children of his slave, Sally Hemings. Now, um, the debate raged for 200 years, practically, until a genetic test was done in 1998, which came to the conclusion that Jefferson fathered his slave's last child. So let's work through this example and uh, you'll see how why DNA has helped to possibly resolve this particular question. Here we have President Thomas Jefferson and his slave, uh, the slave in question, was a very pretty young girl called Sally Hemings who was nursemaid to his own children. Um, she travelled with him to France when he was ambassador there and she looked after his, his young daughters. She was a very pretty girl, um, very light-skinned and could almost pass for white. In fact, three of her children did pass into white society and... Um, did the they um, hid their African ancestry from those people around them, but Sally Hemings had a variety of children. Um, allegedly, her first child was called Tom, um, and uh, the Woodson family believe that their ancestor Thomas Woodson was that first child. Uh, she had six other children, and then she had her youngest child, uh, Eston Hemings. Now, the the one of the daughters of of President Jefferson, um, Martha Jefferson Randolph, she and her family have always maintained that it was not the president that was the father of the children, but rather the president's nephews, or at least one of them, as either Samuel Carr or Peter Carr. And um, uh, that has always been their particular contention. So in order to establish if Thomas Jefferson was the father of uh, Thomas Woodson and Eston Hemings, it was necessary for the researchers to find living direct male line descendants of Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Woodson and Eston Hemings. The problem was that President Thomas Jefferson did not have any direct male line descendants. And so it was necessary to go back to his father and there, from there to his grandfather, um, who would have passed the Y chromosome down to to uh, the president's father and thereafter to the president and to trace living direct male line descendants from Thomas Jefferson II, uh, the president's grandfather. And they identified five living direct male line descendants uh, in the Jefferson line. They did exactly the same with the Carr line and found three living direct male line descendants, um, five di living direct line descendants uh, from the Woodson line, and uh, one direct male line descendant on the Hemings line. So they did the, the DNA testing, and the um, Jefferson group uh, were found to be uh, an exact match, um, which would uh, indicate that they had inherited this uh, DNA unchanged from their common ancestor, Field Jefferson, uh, the president's uncle. So um, because the president's uncle and the president himself shared a common ancestor in Thomas Jefferson II, uh, the assumption is that President Thomas Jefferson would have had an, uh, exactly the same Y DNA as this, these five uh, direct male line living descendants of uh, his uncle. On the car side, the car DNA, the three, three living male line descendants had an exact match on the uh, car DNA, um, indicating that their common ancestor probably had exactly the same uh, Y DNA, and he passed it on to all three of them unchanged. Um, on the Woodson side, <clears throat> the results came back and they showed that there was no connection uh, with the Jefferson DNA, no connection with the Carr DNA. And that ruled out uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and his nephews as potential fathers for Thomas Woodson. However, when the results came back for Eston Hemings, it showed that the uh, Y DNA in his male, direct male line living descendant was an exact match for the DNA of the Jeffersons, and this indicated that it was highly probable that Thomas Jefferson was the father of Eston Hemings. Now, 
it is, let's have a look at these blue squares down here um, in the Woodson uh, line. This represents a non-paternity event. Um, if we analyze the, the four living descendants in brown, it would indicate that Thomas Woodson passed on the Y-DNA, his Y-DNA, unchanged to all four of these living direct male line descendants. Um, and uh, the problem would have arisen with um, an illegitimacy or an adoption uh, either at the level of the uh, the blue square itself or the square that's uh, filled that has an outline in blue. It's difficult to tell exactly where that illegitimacy or adoption occurred, but that would explain this uh, the blue DNA differing from the brown DNA around it. So what has the DNA told us? Well, firstly, it has told us that it is highly improbable that one of the cars was father to any of Sally Hemings' children. It tells us that it is highly improbable that Thomas Woodson's father was a Jefferson or a Carr. And it tells us that it was highly probable that Jefferson fathered Eston Hemings and all six of Sally Hemings' later children. At least that was the conclusion of the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Research Committee. But it could also have been his younger brother, Randolph, because his younger brother would have... Uh, shared exactly the same Jefferson Y DNA. And that was the conclusion uh, of the Thomas Jefferson Heritage Society, who looked at exactly the same information, exactly the same evidence, um, and not just the DNA evidence, but a lot of documentary evidence as well. And they arrived at a completely different conclusion. And this just goes to show what I mentioned earlier, that um, a lot of things in family tree depend on the balance of probabilities and how people see the balance of probabilities will vary from person to person. So that is the story of the president and the slave. Example of why DNA and how can be it can be applied uh, to answer a specific question is an answer from my own family tree and specifically the Spear and Suriname project. Um, and we have a website uh, that you can go to if you just Google Spear and Surname Project, you'll find it. And we also have a, a web page on Family Tree DNA uh, with the results of all the members in our group. And their DNA results are laid out there quite neatly. Now, of course, I am not a Spearin. My Y DNA is not Spearin. My Y DNA is Gleason. Um, Spearin occurs in the midst of my great, great, great grandparents. And in order to get Y-DNA from the middle of my family tree, I had to go back to my great-great-great-grandfather, who was a Spearin, and I had to follow his descendants down on a direct male line, an unbroken Y-DNA line, to my father's third cousin. And I got in touch with him, and he agreed to take the Y-DNA test, and that was Spearin Y-DNA. Now, Shortly after researching the Spearin line, I came across Bob, and Bob uh, has been researching the Spearins for such a long time, over about 20 years now, and he has gathered so much information, it's incredible, and, and himself and various other researchers have put together this, this uh, story about the Spearins. Fantastic story. And it starts off with two will abstracts from Matthew and Luke Spearin in Limerick in the early 1700s. And based on these will abstracts and a variety of other uh, sources and books that were published around the time, it's been possible to put together a family tree of these early Limerick Spearins. Now, um, they were gentry, they were nobility, they were landowners, so there's actually quite a lot of information about them. Um, and they married into the Hartwell family, and they called their children Hartwell Spearin. Charles Hartwell Spearin, George Hartwell Spearin, and so on. And these Hartwells were mayors of Limerick in the late 1600s, they had been granted land there for their services to the army of Charles I. So after the Cromwellian invasion in the 1660s, um, they were granted land. They married into the Spearin family, and of the 236 branches of Spearins that we have identified so far in this project, 24 of these branches have the name 
Hartwell Spearin. And it is these 24 branches of the um, Spearin family tree who can reliably say that on the balance of probabilities, they are related to these early Limerick Spearins, purely because this combination of unusual surnames has persisted down through the years um, and is present in many of the family trees today. Now, not only that, but based on a scrap of paper that Sir William Beetham wrote on regarding the wills that the Spirans had left, and specifically the will of uh, Rebecca Spiran in 1680, uh, there is a link back to London in the 1600s and back into the 1500s, because the Spirans uh, spelt their name differently, Sperring, S-P-E-R-I-N-G, they were goldsmiths in London, so they were very powerful people. And they lived in Leadenhall Street, um, not too far away from the present-day Gherkin. In fact, they're buried quite close to it. And so before that, there was a, a post potential link with Cambridge, where King Henry VIII gave permission for a Nicholas Spearing to start printing. And Nicholas Spearing was one of the first three printers of the Cambridge University Press. And his family came from a large family involved in the book industry from Flanders, which is present-day uh, southern Holland or northern Germany. Um, and he was best friends with Erasmus. So this is such a fantastic story that... Um, one wonders, is this really my family? And this is where genetic testing came to the rescue. Because four of the members tested oh, in early 2011, late 2010. And their, when their results came back, it showed that these people were exact matches or almost exact matches. Uh, the little purple circle at the uh, on the right hand side indicates that this first person differed from the rest by a one step mutation but uh, one step away from a, an exact match is actually still very very close and these people came from New Jersey from Canada from Australia from all over the world but DNA testing was able to ascertain that they were all definitely genetically related so I then persuaded my dad's third cousin to take the test, and his results came back showing he was an exact match with everybody else in the group. And we tested more people over the course of, of, of the following months and years, and um, this is a snapshot of the state of the project in 2012, and it shows that we have 15 members in what we call Genetic Family 1, because they all match each other, uh, or they almost uh, match each other, and all of these people are closely related to each other genetically, and because some of the people have Hartwell Spirans in in their branches, it means that all of us can piggyback across the void of the 1700s and the lack of data therein. Uh, we can piggyback back to these early Limerick Spearans who had the unusual combination of surnames. Now, we did test other people, uh, and these other people did not match the main group of Spearans, and this is possibly because there were there was an adoption somewhere along the line, and the um, Y the transmission of Y-DNA was broken, um, the direct male line was destroyed, um, or it could have been due to illegitimacy, um, or it could be due to the fact that maybe some spearings uh, come from a completely different origin. Maybe all the spearings do not have the same original source for the um, evolution uh, and appearance of the surname. Maybe two different sources produce the same kind of surname. That remains to be elucidated. Another interesting piece of information is that everybody in the uh, who match each other belong to the haplogroup I2B1. And if you look at the frequency of distribution of this particular haplogroup, you find that it has its highest concentration in and around northern Europe, um, Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, and northern Germany. And this would be in keeping with the um, supposition that uh, there may be a connection with Flanders. So, well, 
Here is a pictorial representation of several of the trees, seven altogether. The, the first six are matching and the last one is, is not a match. And the, the people in, in blue are the people that have taken the test. And the people in red are the, the brick walls in each branch of the family. And then before that we have the um, early Limerick Spirans. And then in orange you see the, uh, the London Spearings. And before that in yellow you see the Cambridge uh, Spearings. So uh, what DNA has told us is that it has confirmed the theory. We are all definitely related. We definitely share a common ancestor sometime in the last three to four hundred years. And because of this un uh, unusual combination of surnames, Hartwell and Spearin, uh, which still exist, you can see in um, some of these families today, um, there are three examples in the family on the left, uh, we're able to piggyback with this family and jump across the void of the 1700s back to the early Limerick Spearins. Uh, and we still need to find documentary evidence that confirms um, what we suspect. Uh, and we still need to find out why the Spearins came to Ireland in the first place. Um, we also know from the notes of Sir William Beetham that we are also probably related to the London Spearings. And it would be great to actually find a living uh, descendant along the direct male line that would uh, provide a match with the early Limerick Spearins, but we haven't found anybody to test yet. Um, we also need to find out uh, more about how these London Spearings came over to, to Limerick and bolster that particular connection. Um, we also are possibly related to the Cambridge Spearings, but again, we would need documentary evidence to link Cambridge with London, and it would also be nice to find living direct male line descendants of the Cambridge Spearings who would test and then hopefully match the rest of the early Limerick Spearings. So uh, we also might be related to other Spirins in England and other Spirins in Europe. And one of the main things that we want to try and do now in the future is to encourage people from England with a Spearing pedigree that, that is very English and uh, Spearings in Europe, in uh, Germany and in, in Holland to take the test to see if there is uh, an exact genetic match between the Irish Spearins and English and European Spearins. In terms of the future, it would be nice to test somebody from all 236 branches of the Spearin tree. Um, and that is something that we will try to do over the coming years. And secondly, in time, the sensitivity of the Y-DNA DNA test will probably improve to the extent that we will be able to build not just a family history tree, but a mutation history tree. Because some of the people in the group have mutations, and it's those people who have matching mutations that are more likely to be related to each other than to any other person in the group. So we're looking for people within the group who share the same mutations so that we can say to them, you guys have the same mutations, you're probably more closely related to each other than other members in the group are. So you need to focus your attention on trying to um, trying to find a documentary link, evidence of via documentary research that links your two families together. And that is the story of the Spear and Surname Project so far.